In this section, I'm going to talk about credit analysis and commercial lending. Uh, specifically, I want to spend a little bit of time and talk about common commercial lending products and how they're they're typically structured. How, as a banker, you think about structuring these. And then we'll spend perhaps most of our time with this issue on credit analysis and this particular format called a 4C analysis. So, so let's get started. <clears throat> Standard types of commercial loan products fall broadly into two categories. One, a line of credit, and the other, term loans. And so lines of credit are set up with a maximum amount of loan that a company can can use, but no specific time when they need to take take the, the money down. And so you might set up a line of credit for a million dollars uh, that was available to the company over a year or two year period. And they could use that money, borrow it, repay it, borrow it, repay it, as long as they stay under that million dollars for that entire period of time. In In many cases, Banks will require a, a period of time each year when the company is free of debt so that they're not just constantly using the line of credit as permanent capital. Uh, but subject to those kind of things, the line goes up and down <clears throat> as opposed to a term loan which very much like if you go out and purchase a car, uh, you get the money up front, you get your car, and then you make a set, set kind of payments. And term loans in business are structured exactly the same. Some variations of term loans are these equipment and mortgage loans. And the key here is how they're secured. And so a company that is going to buy a major piece of equipment or a building or a piece of land or something of that sort will get a loan secured by uh, whatever the asset is uh, and, and then pay for it again over the term. This asset-based lending, and often you'll just see it called ABL, uh, is a variation of this. And asset-based lending typically is secured, as the name suggests, by assets, but typically by working capital assets, uh, inventories and receivables being, being the most common ones. So companies that have high amounts of inventories and significant amounts of receivables, particularly those <coughs> excuse me, that, that vary over the course of the year, uh, will take out loans that are backed by these. And then finally, these are not really a type of, of loan as much as a backer of loans. Small business administration loans are very important uh, for, as the name suggests, small businesses. But small businesses are defined as companies with less than 500 employees. So you can have a lot of very good-sized businesses that are taking advantage of these government-backed loans, uh, particularly early, early in their existence. So various types of commercial lending products. How does a banker structure a commercial loan? What, what are the, if, if you're going to work as a, as a commercial lender, what are the things that you're thinking about? Well, first thing you're thinking about is, why do you want the money? What's the purpose of the loan? And is this a short term <clears throat> to handle seasonal uh, cash flow needs as you build up inventory before the sales season? Or is this a long term, something to finance the, the building or the expansion that's there? What is the collateral? And really, I probably should have these two bullets reversed because collateral is important, but it's not as important as a source of cash flow. So what's backing it and what's the life of it? So if it's, if it's a receivable, uh, the receivables are very short term. Uh, if it's a building, it may be 30 years associated with this. And very importantly, what's the source of cash flow to pay back this loan? Cash flow from operations, cash flow from the sale of your accounts receivable or, your, or <clears throat> sale of inventory and the collection of accounts receivable uh, that's there. So we want to be thinking about that. Issues that are always in the back of bankers' minds, and that is you want to avoid having situations where companies are coming for short-term loans, but they need those loans because they don't have sufficient long-term financing. And so that creates a problem where the banks have uh, lines of credit that are maxed out. If they call them, they're probably going to put the company into bankruptcy. On the other hand, if they leave them there, they've effectively become uh, long-term financing that they didn't want to be involved with. And so, so this is part of the stuff we've been doing with Proformas so to look at, at how these things work uh, from here. 
Seasonality is another big thing. We tend to look at end-of-year financial statements, and those are important things to look at, but end-of-year financial statements are only a snapshot of the balance sheet at that particular point, and they can vary widely. And so if you think about a company uh, that has great seasonality, think about a company like Toys R Us that is, that is building up huge amounts of inventory in the early fall because most of their sales, uh, more than half their annual sales are going to occur in, in Q4. The cash conversion cycle, which is an important tool, amount of time in inventories plus the amount of time in accounts receivable minus your accounts payable in days, they can vary widely over the years. So your cash collection cycle when you're selling a lot of stuff may be relatively short, but at other parts of the year, stuff may be sitting in inventory for three or four or five months uh, from there. So we want to think about seasonal needs associated with that. The problem, we talk about credit analysis, <clears throat> we're talking about this systematic analysis of the borrower, their ability to repay, uh, worst case, uh, our, the, our ability to recoup our losses uh, there. I, we've talked a little bit about collateral a couple of times, but I want to make this very clear. Banks are not primarily in the business of repossessing assets. It's the last thing they want to do. They do it reluctantly. They do it when they have to, uh, but their core business is not uh, selling selling uh, repossessed assets they they want to make loans that are going to be repaid and so the the ability and likelihood of repayment is far more important than the ability to recoup your losses so now this 4c analysis and so as i've i've uh, noted up here when we talk about four c's uh we talk about four c's or five and even in some cases Six. And so <clears throat> oftentimes these two here, uh, capital and collateral, will be rolled into one, making it truly a 4C analysis. Other times uh, they'll, be, they'll be dealt with separately like we're going to do today. And so, but we call it 4C analysis. So let's, let's look at, at, the, at the, the four or five Cs. Number one, and intentionally number one, is this thing on character. And so banks investors in general are number one concerned with what is the reputation of the people to whom we are lending. Uh, are these people of high reputation, good ethical reputation? What is their track record? Do they have a reputation of doing what they say? Is have they? How long have they been in this business? Do they know this? What is their lifestyle? <clears throat> are these people who are pulling every conceivable dollar they can out of the business to uh, to fund a lavish lifestyle, or are these careful conservative people who are, are are building a business and putting putting a lot of a lot of their own equity into it? Uh, are they are they people who are taking a lot of unnecessary risks, or are they are they careful? And I talk about conservative. I'm not talking about political conservatism. I'm just talking about our, the degree of care. Are, are are they are they wild risk takers? And if we go bankrupt, uh, the bank will be be left holding this thing. Or are we really trying to slowly build? How are they to deal with in terms of of sharing accurate information? Are they when <clears throat> do they have a reputation for when the uh, when they have a loan and you need updating information that they're quick to get back to you and, and share honest information, uh, or are they, once they get the money, they're hard to deal with? All of these things go in there. And then, of course, are they going to be there? And so is, if are, are these people who are going to be here uh, longer term, if it's a, if it's a family business, uh, where the senior people are have been there a long time and perhaps near the end of their career, is there a plan in place for the for the next generation or other managers to take over? Is there secession planning? This this issue we, sometimes we think, gee, uh, that that's all fine, but let's get to the numbers. But almost every banker will tell you that the number one thing is character. If you've got a you've got an individual with a top reputation, uh, they will be they are more likely to get a loan with with marginal numbers than uh, a a a group of people that the bank doesn't trust that has better better looking numbers. Character is critically important. Conditions. What's going on? This is you're talking about economic conditions. What's going on in the economy? <clears throat> are we in a boom? Are we in a recession? Uh, and how do these changes affect the borrower? 
drilling down what's going on in the industry. So what's the nature of competition that's here? Are there changes? What about disruptors? So, you know, maybe you've been uh, lending to cab companies for uh, for the last 50 years, and now all of a sudden uh, there's Uber and Lyft uh, that's in the market. And these are fundamentally changing the business that's there. And so are there disruptors out there that's going to change the way that, that we do business? And then further down into the very specific community that the individual is working at. So maybe the economy is booming, but something's happened in the local community that it's not nearly as strong. And so we want to look at <clears throat> what's going on. Uh, with unemployment, maybe a major employer nearby that you've relied on is no longer there. So this is really a, a size up of all of the things that are happening uh, with, within the, 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 the borrower's business. Capacity is where all of us finance people with our numbers come into play here. And there are two questions. Will you be able to repay the loan? And is the loan sufficient? Those are the two key things. Do we have do we have the ability to repay it? And then is the loan enough to get done? Because if the loan is not enough, if this if if you're going to make the loan, the company's going to take the loan, invest the loan, and then all of a sudden still be struggling because they don't have enough money, well, the bank doesn't want to be involved in with, with that to start with. So how do we measure that? This is where a lot of pro formas and ratios come in here. So we want to look at the company's liquidity, its current ratio, its quick ratio, its cash ratio, all of these ratios to current liabilities. What, what's its profitability in absolute terms compared to its competition uh, and expectations, its gross margin, its operating margin, its net margin, its return on assets, return on equity? Coverage ratios are really important, and generally with coverage ratios, we pick up EBITDA, <clears throat> earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. And the reason for that is that depreciation and amortization are non-cash expenses. And so it doesn't really matter how much depreciation expenses you've got because there's a non-cash. What I want to know is how kind of operating earnings – ignoring depreciation and amortization I have to either cover my interest payments and so if I have an interest only loan then interest coverage may be the most critical thing this is probably in most cases the most important one which is your debt service coverage which is the same numerator but in addition to interest here you've got interest plus principal here uh, <clears throat> pick up the principal portion, so your payments plus your interest that's there. And then we can look at overall measures of leverage, total debt to total assets, long-term debt to total assets, debt equity. This is where our old friend, the pro has come in here. So let's look at those for a second. So if we look at the kind of pro formas that we might be looking at here, where where do we pick these up? Well, we've got our profitability measures all up in, in the income statement that's here. We take the income statement here and our, and our operating earnings, convert those to EBITDA, pick up our debt service costs, and so we can calculate our coverage ratios that are here. Liquidity measures, picking up various pieces uh, of, our, of our current assets compared to current, to current liabilities. Leverage measures, picking up the, the various portions of long-term debt and total debt compared to equity. And then this piece down here at the bottom, uh, additional funds. That answers the question, is the loan enough? And so if we find that there's massive amounts or significant amounts of additional funds needed at the bottom, well, that'll, that'll lead us away from, from getting the loan. So this is where we use uh, our pro formas from here. Third C, uh, capital. And so capital refers to the other resources the company has to bring to bear. And those may be either within the firm or outside of the firm from here. So within the firm, do they have an excess of working capital that could be liquidated? What's the net worth? Do they have a good equity position? Now, we can't spend retained earnings, but companies that have large amounts of equity compared to the amount of debt generally are better than those that have less. Are there excess business assets? Does the company have things that push come to shove could be liquidated uh, to pay off the loan? Outside the firm, are there is, are the owners... Do they have substantial wealth? And so if you've got an individual who has substantial personal wealth that they can bring to bear on the company, uh, that's good. Are there guarantors? Are there, are there other outside individuals or companies who stand to back the loans that's there? And if there are, then we may 
have to do a creditworthiness uh, on on that particular company as well. But we're, what we're capturing here is what other what other what other assets can be what resources assets can can be brought to bear on this loan. Collateral, as mentioned before. Banks are not in the business of repossessing assets as as their first choice. This is a this is a last case scenario, but not unimportant. So, what assets can be pledged, and what is their value? Very importantly, is do they have use outside the industry? So, if you compare, for example, a company that might have a a distribution warehouse that's just a big concrete box with uh, loading docks and could be used for just about any kind of product, that may have much more use if this business in this particular industry goes south compared to something that does something very specific. So uh, a a business that is uh, uh, in in the process of, of doing chemical coatings or something and they have a lot of very specialized equipment that's used in that business but not used by anybody else and then so even though it has value if the industry is sinking nobody's going to want to buy it and you're going to have to independently assess you're going to have to go out and look at uh, not just take the the business's word for it you're going to need to do an independent assessment of what they're worth <clears throat> also have they been pledged to somebody else so does somebody else have a claim on these assets if you're going to accept them as collateral they have to be insured because if the if the uh, uh, plant burns down then there goes your collateral that's there and collateral assets are inspected by the banks on an ongoing basis so they want to make sure that they're being maintained the sixth C <coughs> excuse me <coughs> so we're into we're into our six of our of our four C's here but some people will add this 60, and it's, it's an important piece of that. And this is covenants, loan covenants. And so when you make a loan, banks don't just give you the loan and say, good luck. They are, what are the other kind of obligations that they impose on the borrower that's there? And so common kinds of things are debt ratios. So you may have to maintain a debt equity ratio that's not bigger than some number. Uh, your debt service coverage, so we were doing those back before. So you must have to have debt service that's at least one and a half. EBITDA has to be at least one and a half times uh, your, your debt service. Uh, or interest coverage must be three times or four times or eight times, whatever the number number is there. There's also some limitations uh, that are put on. And so very common is if we're going to borrow, we're going to lend you money, then we're going to restrict you from borrowing any more uh, without, our, without our permission so that you you have a limited amount of debt now. We lend you the money, and you borrow a whole lot more. Now you're now you're more levered than we would like you to be. We also want to restrict the amount of withdrawals, either in the form of dividends or other kinds of withdrawals from from the company. We don't want them bleeding the company dry and leaving us with loan uh, from there. So this this section we have really talked about four or five or six C's associated with that. But I want to stress as as we wrap this up, this final piece, and that is that this decision to lend is a qualitative decision. So we've we've got lots of numbers. We're finance folks, we've got lots of numbers here. But when we look at the pieces, when we talk about character and conditions uh, specifically, they those are not those are not numerical kinds of decisions. They are qualitative. And so we have lots of quantitative inputs, uh, particularly around capacity and our performance and our coverage ratios and all of that. But the decision, like a lot of finance decisions, is a qualitative decision based on a combination of both quantitative and qualitative inputs. I look forward to seeing you in class.